Hello, I'm Lisa and thanks for tuning in. Today, I'm going to show you how to play the Castles of Burgundy. Now, I should start by saying that this game could appear complicated at first, but you can learn and teach this game. I'd recommend reading the rule book before or after watching this video to familiarize yourself more with the game. This game is considered middleweight at a score of 3 out of 5 and may be harder to grasp for non-gamers. I'll be sure to clarify on areas that I think the rulebook could have done a better job on. This video is meant to be thorough, over speedy, but still to get to the point. If you want to skip the setup and see the tutorial, skip to this timestamp. The object of this game is to gain victory points. The person with the most victory points wins. You gain victory points through various means of building out your castle area and selling goods. I'll talk more about how to do this and strategy in a bit. Let's get into the setup. Let's start with the centralized board. In the top left corner, you see those boxes labeled A through E. These indicate the five phases of the game. Below A, you see five other white boxes. These indicate the rounds in each phase. This means there are five rounds in each phase, so each player should assume 25 turns in the game. More on the rounds and phases later. These phase boxes are meant to hold good tiles. These are the square tiles that come in six different colors. Shuffle these up into stacks of five and place them on top of each phase. Place unused goods to the side for now. Since you are starting in the first phase, turn up all five goods into the boxes below. Over on the top right and bottom of the board, you will see six large and small squares. Place the bonus tiles of the appropriate color and size here. We'll talk more about claiming those in the gameplay and strategy. In the center, you'll see hexagons with different colors and numbers. The numbers indicate a two, three, or four player game. You'll fill these up according to how many players. So in our two-player example, we wouldn't fill in the hexagon with a three and four. It's worth noting that this specific three, dark green hexagon, shows that the color changes on the phase. So in phase A, C, and E, this is dark green, but in B or D, this is gray. The game would have you shuffle the different color tiles and place them near the board for setup. But here's a hack that I did to keep things organized in the box. Blue, dark green, and gray tiles are all the same, meaning there is no variety to them no matter what you pick. So I store these together. Light green, beige, and yellow do have variety to them. I keep them in this bottom section so I can shuffle and replace the tiles without looking. These black tiles actually have the same fronts of the other colored tiles and is noted as black by the back and the small dot on the front. I keep these separate to allow me to mix them and not get them confused with their counterparts. Lastly, take one player token for your color and place them on the zero on the victory track. You can score pretty high numbers in this game. So there are these circular tiles that can be placed on the track once you lap 100 or even 200 to indicate your score. The second player token will be placed nearby on the beige circle next to the circles with the ships on them. This will indicate turn order. Hand each player their color dice and have them roll one. The player with the higher roll goes first, followed by subsequent rolls, and this is indicated by being placed on top of the other player's token. Hand each player their player board. When you are starting out, make sure you are using the board that has a one on the bottom. There are other variants to the layout on the back of the boards that you can use as you get more comfortable. Each player receives three shuffled goods and turns them over. These are placed face up in the boxes with the good symbol on the top left. You can only have three different colored goods at any time, and you can stack goods of the same color. Each player gets one silver in the oval with the silver symbol, and the first player will get one worker in the bottom left circle with the worker symbol. Second player would get two, third would get three, and so on. Finally, each player is given one castle, the dark green piece. That is placed in the center. That's the setup. Now let's get into actual playing, strategy, and what each tile means. The decisions you make in this game are determined by your dice rolls. 
First player rolls their color dice along with the white die. The white die is only rolled once per round and indicates where the first good will be placed. In this example, we rolled a six. So the good is moved to the box on the board that indicates the six dice roll. I'll get into more detail on why you care later. Your colored dice gives you the option of four different actions to take. You use one die per action. So a typical turn would have you making two decisions. The actions are indicated on the right side of your player board as a reminder. Action one is grabbing a piece from the centralized board based on your dice roll. Once grabbed, the piece is not replaced on the central board. This happens during the next phase. This piece is always put in the reserves down below on your player board. It is not built. That is a different action. Once you have used a dice action, place it in the use dice section on the top right. For strategy, you can only place tiles on your castle area that are adjacent to an already built tile. So keep this in mind when you are selecting your tiles. Action two is building a tile on your castle area. You can only place a tile in the same color and number requested by the roll. Once a tile is placed, the action of the tile is played immediately. Let me pause here to go through the different tiles. Your player board also has this listed on the side. Blue tiles are your ships. When you place a ship, you get to move your player piece up in turn order. Turn order is always determined by who is farthest right and most on top. So if another player played a ship and surpassed or landed on top of you, they are the player for the next round to go first, with everyone else's turn order following in that same respect. They would get the white die next. When building a ship, you also get to take all the goods in any box on the board. Dice roll doesn't matter. Remember, you can only keep three different colored goods on your board at one time. You can choose to not take this action if you want, or you can discard goods that you have back into the box and replace them with new goods that you picked. Dark green are castles. These essentially give a theoretical extra die value of any number you want. You can use this extra die to take any of the four actions you'd like. Gray are mines. These produce one silver per mine for you at the end of each phase, not round, phase. This is passive income. Light green are your animals. These are victory points scored immediately based on how many animals are on the tile. Something really cool about the animal tiles is that you can create a chain of scoring, where if you build the same animal type within the same pasture, you can score again on the previously played tile. A great way to get more victory points. If you play a different animal type, then you wouldn't get to recount the tiles. And if you are building in different regions altogether, then you could not chain. Same animal type, same region, gives you the ability to score multiple times on an animal tile. So in this example, if you first played the two pigs, you would score two victory points. Then when you played the four pigs, you would get four victory points plus the two from the previous pig tile. The four sheep would only be scored as such and no chain would happen. Beige are your building tiles. Their functions are indicated on the player board and can be helpful to keep the rulebook nearby to fully understand what each one does until you are familiar with the symbols. I don't want to throw information out that can overcomplicate this overview, so I'll let you look up what each building does, but it ranges from collecting silver, victory points, and even actions like being able to build from your reserves without needing to roll. Lastly, the yellow knowledge tiles. These vary from in-game effects to end-game scoring. Definitely refer to the rulebook on these until you understand the iconography. Black tiles in the center are not gained through dice rolls, but by paying two silver. You can do this at any point during your turn. When you buy these tiles, they are placed in the reserves like every other tile. Okay, back to the other actions you can take with your dice. Action three is selling your goods. You can sell your goods based on the dice roll matching that of the goods and sell that entire color. You get one silver for the sale regardless of how many goods are in that stack. You do, however, score victory points immediately for each individual good in the stack. Turn them face down in your sold goods section once completed. Fourth and final action is you can use a die of any value to trade in for two workers to be added to your supply. The workers have a minus one plus one value on them. Worker tiles modify the value of your dice roll. If you don't like the number you rolled, use workers to add or subtract roll value. It's helpful to think of the numbers one through six on a loop rather than a straight line. 
which means you can turn a six into a one by using the plus one and not needing to play five workers. Now that you know what the tiles mean and how to use your action, let's talk about the best way to build your boards to maximize points. As we started to discuss regions a little bit earlier, regions are sections of one color tile without any breaks. Once you have built and completed a region, you are able to score various points. The first place to look on your player board will show you how many points a region scores based on how large it is. So a one tile region scores one point and a five tile region scores 15 points. The next place to look is on your central board. The victory point value under each phase is the bonus for completing a region in that phase. Completing a region in phase A will give you 10 points while only two in phase E. The quicker you can complete a region, the more points you are rewarded. Tally up the total and score yourself immediately. Now, if you complete an entire color set, you will first score on the region using the method discussed, but also grab the bonus scoring from the right side of the central board based on the color you just completed. Take the big bonus tile if you're the first to do so. Take the second bonus tile if you're the second to do so. Unfortunately, you won't be able to take these bonus tiles if you're not first or second, but you will, of course, be able to score on the region. The bonus tiles value is dependent on the number of players. So the big bonus would be five at a two player game and the small bonus would be two. So on and so forth with the player counts. Play continues back and forth as you go through each round and then ultimately ends the phase. At phase end, give each player a silver worth how many mines they have. Clear all colored hexagons from the board and replace them the same way as set up. Do not clear the goods. Take the five goods from the next phase to lay out in the white boxes. Take a look at the turn order. Make sure the first player has the white die. Continue on like this until the game ends. Once the game is over, you will do some end game scoring by giving each player one victory point for every silver, one victory point for every unsold good, one victory point for every two workers, and then scoring yellow tiles built that have an end game effect. The player with the highest score wins. And that, my friends, is how you set up and play the Castles of Burgundy. I certainly hope you found this walkthrough helpful. And if you have any questions, please feel free to comment and I will get back to you as I can. Now go set up your game and have fun playing. Like and subscribe for more content like this. And remember, never stop playing.